Hello, everybody. My name is Glenn Starkman, and I'm the director of the Institute for the Science of Origins here at Case Western Reserve University, a partnership of CWRU, the Cleveland Museum of Natural History, and IdeaStream. Welcome to the fourth in our nine-part series on the Origin Science Scholars, presented to you by the Institute for the Science of Origins with the assistance of the College of Arts and Sciences and the Museum of Natural History and the generous support of Richard Morrison. Over 150 years after Darwin's origin of species, evolution is one of the most successful scientific theories and controversial only in the public eyes. So for that reason in particular, I'm pleased to welcome Darren Croft, Associate Professor of Anatomy and ISO Fellow here at Case Western Reserve University in the School of Medicine to begin our three-week series on an introduction to evolution with a talk entitled The Evidence for Biological Evolution. Thank you very much. It's a real, it's a real pleasure for me to be here to talk to you a little bit tonight about uh, evolution. I'm a paleontologist by training, and so I wouldn't have anything to do if there weren't for evolution. It would be a very boring fossil record. We're going to start off by talking a little bit uh, about evolution and natural selection, talk about some terms, talk about processes, kind of the nuts and bolts. And then we're going to move on to a little bit into explaining patterns and observing evolution, really talking about some examples that we can look to both in the modern world and the fossil real world that show us why, as Glenn has said, this is really such a powerful theory, keeping in mind, of course, that a theory and scientific lingo is really a, a related series of ideas that explain lots of, lots of phenomena. So let's start talking a little bit about evolution. What actually is evolution? And this is a scientific term that I think everyone's familiar with, although they might not know exactly what it means. Really, in its simplest sense, it's, it's just change through time. If we go back to the Latin roots, it comes from the, the word to unfold or to unveil. So in that sense, I guess my talk is evolving. But really in the common day sense, the way that we use the term, evolution is really just change through time. And we can talk about things that change through time. If you're into cars, we can talk about the evolution of American muscle cars, evidently from 1966 to 1972. We can see that these are changing in their design. And so we could generally talk about this as evolution, which if it were a little darker up there, I think you could actually see it says evolution at the bottom. You can take my word for that. Anyone ever seen this guy, Evolution Dance? If not, when you're back at home, have internet access, go to YouTube, go Evolution of Dance. It's a hilarious routine. This guy's a comedian and he talks about the evolution of dance. Starts with 50s dances and kind of works his way through. And uh, I think he kind of plays off the fact that he's not necessarily the, the coolest guy. He's not a John Travolta out there, but it's a lot of fun. But again, it's this sense of change through time, simply evolution. I generalize this to say <coughs> that evolution is an observed or an inferred pattern. And a lot of what we do in science is we look at data, we try to come up with patterns, and then we try to come up with explanations for those patterns. And evolution is a pattern, one that often we infer, but sometimes we think we can actually observe it. We can talk about a specific type of evolution, however, and that's important to specify, and that's biological evolution. And that encompasses change in populations, species, and groups. Populations being groups of individuals. Species is something we're going to hit on in a couple more weeks. It's not quite as straightforward as we'd like it to be, but uh, it's a group of individuals that breed together exclusively. And then groups, higher level groups, things like humans, primates, rodents, etc. We can speak of microevolution, and this generally deals with evolutionary processes at the population level. And if you ever heard the term macroevolution, this usually refers to evolution of species or the origins of higher groups. These two are really just parts of a continuum. We often are dividing up continua in the science. But the divide, if you will, between microevolution and macroevolution has been, I think, for a lot of people, something that's conceptually difficult to overcome. We can see microevolution. We can't see macroevolution in the same way. But really, we think it's the same processes that are just acting on different scales. Implicit in this is the idea that all species are related. 
that they're all descended from a common ancestor. And because of this, that we can organize them in nested hierarchy. So today when we talk about different groups, hominids, monkeys, rodents, we organize those groups based on how they're related. We find that they often share lots of characteristics, but that's not what makes something part of a group. It is ancestry. It's like your family. You may look like your brother, but that's not what makes him a sibling. It's the fact that you share a common ancestry. And we'll hit on these things again, so don't worry about if you don't get it all the first time. I'm a firm believer in repetition. How about natural selection? In contrast to evolution, which I argue is a pattern, natural selection is a process. And this, we think, is one of the most important, if not the most important process that accounts for the patterns that we see in nature. Specifically, it is a process that was proposed to account for the origin of species, also known as the mystery of mysteries. And of course, who said the mystery of mysteries? You, you can't answer, if you know. Pardon? No. Who do you think of when you think of evolution? Darwin, right. Yeah, when in doubt, guess Darwin, if the question has to do with evolution. And that, of course, was in his now famous work on the origin of species by means of natural selection. So right there, he tells you what he's going to talk about. He's talking about the origin of species by means of through the process of natural selection. And natural selection was really the brilliant idea that Darwin had. There are lots of other things rolled up in this volume, and I'd encourage you to read it if you hadn't. It's actually surprisingly readable. But really the key thing that another individual that we'll talk about in a little bit also came up with is this idea of natural selection. And the subtitle there, or the preservation of favored races in the struggle for life. So before we get into the little bit of nuts and bolts about natural selection, I'd like to point out a few other processes that can account for evolution. So natural selection isn't the only one. One is genetic drift, sometimes known as random genetic, uh, genetic drift. Random may be redundant, right? If you think of something drifting in the wind, the leaf is just moving aimlessly, drifting on the high seas. Your daughter, who just graduated, could also be drifting around with not really any direction. And this can also occur in populations, especially with particular traits that don't seem to have a big effect on how successful they are in terms of reproduction. And for a long time, we thought that natural selection was really everything that shaped the genome. But now it turns out that there's a lot of drift that goes on that just happens, changes that happen. But given enough time, this can also lead to changes in populations, speciation, and other events. So it's a different process that results in the pattern of evolution. Evolution, again, being changed through time. And I put an asterisk there because it's, it's the other one that's really important, along with natural selection. Genetic bottlenecks. If you picture a bottle, wine bottle, it has a large base, and then the bottleneck, of course, is a narrow part. And this can happen in populations through time. Let's say you have a population of birds that are living on an island and a hurricane comes through, happens to take out 95% of the birds. The variation that you're left with is a small proportion of what you started with. And evolution will only take it from there. And so you've really gone through this bottleneck in terms of diversity. And so genetic bottlenecks can also affect the course of evolution. Founders effects. Founders effects are similar. If we go back to our island analogy, and this is the reason that lecture three in this series is going to talk a lot about islands, because they're good for illustrating all sorts of evolutionary principles. But let's say we've got uh, a rodent or a pair of rodents that happen to get to an island. There are no other rodents there. They say, heck, this looks like a great place. Let's start breeding. And they do, and they start a new population. That new population will have variation that depends to a large extent on the genes of those two founders. And those are what's known as founder's effects. They may not be representative of the ancestral population. Sort of like a bottleneck, but in a slightly different scenario. Artificial selection. Everyone's familiar with that. We want to breed cows that have 
more meat, less fat. We want to breed dogs that are cute or ugly or don't bark, whatever. That's another form of evolution. We call it artificial because we are thinking about what we want and we're selecting it based on that. Um, but it's really the same process, just a slightly different application. And sexual selection. This is a really interesting one. As we'll see just a couple of slides from now, evolution is really about passing your genes on to the next generation. Usually that requires sex, not always, but certainly for things like us that have backbones, it does. Sex requires two partners, and being able to attract another partner or one partner selecting with whom they're going to copulate can also affect the course of evolution. This, we think, is one of the things that accounts for the garish tales of peacocks, uh, all sorts of other different characteristics. So sexual selection can also have dramatic effects on evolution. Keeping in mind, again, these are all other processes. They all are important to varying degrees, and to a large extent, it depends on the particular animal or population or group that we're looking at. This is one of the things evolutionary theorists do. We study different groups to try to assess how important are these different processes in creating the patterns that we see. How about things that don't cause change? Acquired characteristics. This was an idea that was in vogue for a while that a useful characteristic that you acquired during your lifetime could be passed on down to your descendants. One example of this might be, let's say, shrubs that are living in a very hot, dry climate get very waxy cuticles on their leaves. Depending on if you grow a plant under particular conditions, it will change its leaves. But that won't necessarily be passed on to its progeny. Another example that people always uh, throw out there are, are dogs and short-tailed short dogs. Let's say you want to breed a dog with a short tail. You can't cut off its tail and hope that it has babies that have short tails. It may happen, but it's not going to be because of that. And of course, we kind of laugh at that and say, well, you know, it only takes one generation to figure that out. But remember, scientists back in the day that really didn't necessarily understand how genetics worked might not think it were that obvious. They might think, well, you know, you're not going to inherit the whole short tail. What you're going to have is a slightly shorter tail the next generation. And so scientists would breed generations and generations of mice, each of which they cut off the tail. And then after a long series, they'd measure to see if there are any statistical differences. And of course, it turns out that there aren't. Internal drive for perfection probably don't need to say a whole lot about this, but this is another idea that animals essentially have some sort of internal drive to progressively get better adapted to their environment. It's kind of a, a, a different perspective on what we think is happening. We do think that animals become better adapted for their environments, but it's not because of some internal drive that they have. Needs or desires. Let's say we have an ungulate, a hoofed animal, that's living in an area where all the trees are just a little bit out of reach. So it stretches and stretches its neck to try to get up to those leaves. And just a little bit, it extends its neck. And then after generations and generations and generations of these animals needing to reach up to these leaves, eventually you get a longer and longer necked animal. Right? This is an idea of how you might get a giraffe. Just because something is needed or desired doesn't mean that evolution is going to settle on that solution. And I think this is something that Dr. Cynthia Bell is going to talk a bit about next week and adaptation and how adaptation works. But one of the take home message is, one of the take home messages is, you have to have variation on which evolution can act. It's not because you want it or you need, want or need something. So these are all refuted processes. And there are others, but just to give you an idea that there are some ideas that we've had that have been discarded. And certainly in the future there will be new ideas that will test and it'll either go on the first slide or we'll go on this one. So let's talk a little bit about nuts and bolts of what I'll call the Darwin-Wallace model. And the reason we call it the Darwin-Wallace model is because it was independently conceived both by Charles Darwin, who I think you're all at least familiar with the name of, who'd been working on this for years and years and years, and Alfred uh, Russell Wallace, who was much more of a field man, kind of a rough and tumble guy, spent a lot of time in South America, later on over in the southeast collecting specimens and sending them back to London to earn a living essentially. And he independently came up with this idea of natural selection. And they were, the ideas were jointly read 
at a meeting in the Royal Society of London, and so we call it the Darwin Wallace model. And that model is evolution by natural selection. It requires four conditions. I'm going to test you on this after dinner. First, population resources are limited. Fortunately, this will not affect us this evening because if I know anything about the food back there, it is far from limited. This results in limited survival and, and uh, reproduction. Charles Darwin was dramatically influenced by an essay on, the, on population by Charles Malthus, who essentially said that human populations are going to reproduce more quickly than the resources we have to support them, specifically that they'd, re they'd reproduce geometrically and that we could only um, arithmetically add to food supplies and things like that, and that this would result in famine, et cetera, et cetera. And this really lit a light in Darwin's head, thinking, you know, if that's the case, how do you decide who's going to live and who's going to die? And so this is one condition, that you have to have those limited resources. If you've got plenty of resources, then you're not going to have evolution, at least not through natural selection. Second condition, the population is variable. You have to have variation on which evolution can act. If a population that's exactly the same, you can't have anything selected for or against. Not enough to have variation. That variation has to be heritable. If everyone gets a tan, that's not going to be passed on to your progeny. So it has to be variation that's heritable. How much hair you have, how tall you are, how smart you are. And that variation has to affect your reproduction, your reproductive success. Keep in mind, reproduction comes down to two things, essentially. One, living long enough to have sex. And two, having progeny that results from that. So the more times you have sex and the more progeny you have, then the higher chance, uh, the more representation your genes are going to have in the next generation. So if variation affects that, then natural selection might be operating. If the, if the variation is unrelated to it, it doesn't matter. So if we have this population that's variable, heritable population that then affects reproduction, keeping in mind what we said with point one there, that there's limited survival and reproduction, what you will end up with then is change in the population through time. Because the variation that results in better reproductive success in next generation will account for a higher proportion of the variation. And it's this iterative process if conditions stay the same, that will result in directional evolution. And specifically, keeping in mind, we're talking about biological evolution, this nested hierarchy of relatedness, all these animals related genetically. And a phrase that you often hear is descent with modification. This is Darwin's phrase. Descent, changing from one generation to the next with modification based on that variation that's affecting reproduction. I'm going to throw out two more terms, and I promise that's it. One of these is fitness. Fitness is a term that you may run into that encompasses how successful you are at reproducing, keeping in mind that that has to do both with survival and how many of your genes you're passing on to the next generation. So something that has a high fitness will pass on a lot of genes. The other term we'll talk about is adaptation. And an adaptation is this variation that has been selected for because it positively affects reproduction. And a lot of studies in evolution deal with figuring out what are adaptations, why are adaptations. And they're very interesting because an adaptation is not absolute. It always depends on your environment. And the environment is never the same. And we'll hear lots and lots about this next week, I expect. This is just to put in another plug for the origin of species. This was, it was actually supposed to be a huge book. And Darwin got a letter from Wallace saying, well, you know, he really looked up to Charles Darwin because he was known very well for his Voyage on the Beagle, which is this very adventuresome book that a lot of people had read. He thought, well, I, you know, I have this idea. What do you think about it? And Darwin reads it, and he says, shoot, this is my idea. I really should have published this. 
And so he gets on it and he writes this abstract, and this abstract turns into On the Origin of Species. And it's very well written. It's got a lot of great examples. You can buy it all over the place now since it's been out for 150 years with this anniversary. People put out a lot of editions. But if you don't want to forge through that, there are other options. There's this one that I came across in a store that is really kind of fun. It is, I believe the politically correct term is a graphic novel format for Charles Darwin's On the Origin of Species. It's a graphic adaptation. Graphic in the good sense, not in the X-rated sense. And it goes through and has a lot of the same wordings from The Origin of Species, but has nice illustrations that point out a lot of Darwin's works, too. So one way or another, I definitely encourage you to read the original work on natural selection. So the take-home messages. Biological patterns are evolutionary patterns. And that's what we're going to spend the rest of this lecture talking about are these patterns. Organisms are related in a nested hierarchy. This has to do with the fact that they're passing gen genetic material on from one to another, and that's what's accounting for biological evolution. The reason I put that asterisk there is because this just works for you know 99% of organisms. When you get down to single-celled animals, it actually gets a little bit more complicated than that. But for the most part, nested hierarchy is a good way to go. And finally, organisms are shaped by natural selection. Each of these has a subtext. Keep in mind that when we talk about biological patterns, these patterns can result from several different processes. We already mentioned natural selection. We mentioned random genetic drift. There's also sexual selection, founder's effects, et cetera, et cetera. So don't go away thinking natural selection is the only thing that drives evolution. It's a, it's a prime mover, but it's not the only thing. Because animals are in this nested hierarchy, ancestry affects morphology. It's not random that you look like your mom or that you smile like your dad. Same thing happens with monkeys and with rats and with rhinos. Who they're related to affects their morphology. But the other thing that affects their morphology is adaptation, ecology where they live, how they make a living. My job as a paleontologist is to spend a lot of time sorting out what things come from ancestry and what things come from adaptation. And it's a lot of fun. That's just a second of assimilation time there, just to me. Let it soak in. OK, everyone good? We're going to move on then. No more jargon. What we're going to talk about now is just explaining these patterns. Remember, as a biologist, we look out and we ask, why does a peacock have a big tail? Why does a giraffe have a long neck? Why do we only find these lizards on these sorts of rocks? We are finding patterns. And what we want to come up with are explanations for those patterns. The explanation that we've come up with is biological evolution. So now we're just going to go through a few of those different types of examples that are best explained by biological evolution. And I'm going to have categories for these. So we'll take a, a look at a few specific cases, but they fall within general categories. For example, anomalies and inefficient design. This is a good example. I know we have some physicians and other bio biological types in the audience here. The structure of the human eye. I teach anatomy, so there are a few anatomy examples in here. Here we're looking at a cross-section of a human eye. Here's the front. Here's the back. Here's the lens, which, of course, is labeled lens, and all these other parts that you don't need to worry about. I do want to call your attention to the retina back here in the back, which has a red arrow labeled retina. It has two parts to it. It's got a part here in front, and it's got a part here in back. The back part is where your pigment cells are, and those are the cells that actually receive photons of light and allow you to see. The front part are these neural cells. And they essentially take the information from your pigment cells, they bring it together, they collect it into the optic nerve, which is cranial nerve number two, and they send it back to your brain. This is not a great design. <laughs> Light has to pass through the neural cells before it gets to the pigment cells. Plus, you have a blind spot, a blind spot at the back of your eye or oculus, where all of these have to come together and exit. Why would anyone design anything like this? It doesn't make a whole lot of sense. 
If you look at the development, you can see how this happens. Turns out the eye forms kind of like a balloon off the brain, and then it's punched in, and those two layers come together, and that's what forms the two layers of your retina. If you get whacked on the back of the head hard enough, they come apart again and you get a detached retina. There are other ways to design an eye. And an octopus has one such eye. And I, I said design, but using that facetiously. This is the way that I would design an eye, be it for an octopus or anyone else. The retina is in the back, just like it is with ours. And it's really a remarkable case of convergence. It's got a lot of the same parts. It's got a lens to help focus. It's got a pupil to regulate how much light's coming in. But this is the way we'd want to have it designed. The part in front are the pigment cells. The part in back are the neural cells, collects all that information, shunts it out to the back to the optic ganglion. No blind spot for the octopus. Works out very well. And we know this is totally independently derived, partly because of its structure and partly because the close relatives of octopus and squid like that don't even have eyes. The way that we can explain these two different phenomena is because of different ancestry. Humans and other backbone animals came from a chordate ancestor, whereas the octopus came from a mollusk ancestor. Through millions and millions of years, these different ancestors had evolved, and they had different constraints on their development. It just worked out that the octopus way to develop an eye was better than the ones that we came up with. The key with natural selection is it doesn't have to be the best. It just has to be better. And so ours, although it's not an optimal design, it works out well enough. Let's move a little farther down. I actually teach head and neck anatomy, so I <laughs> hadn't realized, but all these are head and neck examples. Human digestive and respiratory tracts. Here we're looking at a cross section of a human. It might look familiar if you went to body worlds or anything like that. This blue line represents where air comes in. So this is going to be our nostril right here, assuming you're not a mouth breather. Comes in through your nose back here, runs down through the pharynx, passes down through here through our larynx, our voice box, and thence into the lungs. Food, on the other hand, comes through the mouth, past the lips, over the tongue, through the back of the tongue, again through the pharynx, and has to run posteriorly to enter the esophagus, which then connects to the gut, the stomach, and you go south from there. You can see that in this area right here, we have an intersection of where the food goes and where the air goes. And this is not a great design. Again, if we we're going to design this, put the air in the back, put the food in the front, and everything's good. But in fact, this works pretty well for most backboned animals besides humans. The problem with humans is that our larynx is down farther than it is in a lot of other animals. In other animals, this little flap right here, which is the epiglottis, is up higher. And it does a better job of sealing off the back of the tongue when you're swallowing. So you can actually breathe and swallow at the same time. And in fact, babies don't generally have this problem. And that's a fa that has to do with the fact that the larynx starts up higher and only goes down later on. So this is just a peculiarity of the human. And here's a, a slightly more diagrammatic view. We do have things that we do when we swallow to help keep milk from coming out our nose and things like that. This muscle up here helps to close off the soft palate. This one down here comes forward, and we raise our larynx, but we can still choke. The reason it's set up this way is because our original ancestors, fishes, didn't have two tubes, one that air went through and one that food went through. They had one tube that the food went through, and then there were outlets out the side, the gills, through where gas exchange took place. Why do we have this problem? Because some fish happened to develop a swim bladder, and then when fish went out on the land, this swim bladder was co-opted and turned into lungs. Evolution just makes do with what it has. It doesn't start off thinking, hmm, what is the best way to design an air passage and a GI tract? So those are some nice examples that you can think about next time you're looking in the mirror. How about atavistic structures? Atavistic is just a fancy term for leftovers. I also like reptiles and amphibians. So I'm going to throw in a few reptile and amphibian examples here. Just to orient you, we're looking at a boa constrictor. We're looking at its underside. And those two little nubs right there are known as spurs. They're covered with keratin, same sort of stuff that's on your fingernail, and they're just little points. The tail is to the top. The rest of the snake is down below. Snakes are mostly thorax, actually. They have very, very short tails. And right here is where the cloaca is, which is the common exit passage for 
reproductive stuff and excretory stuff. And if you ever want to know how to sex a snake, this is where you need to do it. But they're inside. But these little spurs right here, which really aren't used for much now, are legs. They are the remnants of snake legs. And how do we know this? One way is we can look at development, see that they have the same attachments, they develop in the same place. But we can look back through the fossil record, and we can see where in somewhat primitive snakes like these boas, in their earliest ancestors, these were larger, and we eventually find snakes with legs. They don't do anything in the snake now. Why do you have them there? Evidently, it hasn't been a big enough issue for natural selection to deal with, so they're just hanging out. They're just hanging on there, but they really don't serve any structure. It makes sense if we think of this as a historical remnant. This is a fun one, too. Chicken teeth. Those little points are chicken teeth. And it's okay if you don't recognize this is a chicken. This is not a Rorschach test. This is a developing chicken, and it's a special mutant form known as talpid. And talpid is a mutant that's studied for limb patterning, I believe. But talpid actually means mole-like, so I expect it gets really short mole-like limbs or something like that. But we're not concerned with the limbs. We're concerned with these pointy things, which are teeth. These talpid mutants happen to develop teeth that look like those of crocodiles, which we think are the closest living relatives of birds. It seems that when you start messing around with the developmental architecture of this of these chickens that you can turn on genes that have been turned off and you can get the appearance of structures that don't appear in the adults anymore. In fact, this is a neat example of something that was done a long time ago. They found that you could implant tissue from the mouth of, I believe it was lizards, into chickens and actually grow teeth, which shows the genes are still there, but they're just not using them. Why would a chicken have a gene for teeth? Doesn't need them, gets along just fine with the bill, as do all the rest of the birds. Makes sense in the light of evolution. To kind of follow up our teeth theme, we can find the specific genes and we can watch them decay. There are lots of mammals that have lost their teeth, evolutionarily speaking. This is a pangolin. This is a skull. We're looking at the roof of the mouth. The nose is facing towards the right. These are known as scaly anteaters. They're very cool animals. They're covered with a, an armor that's made of scales, just like your fingernails, sort of like big fish scales. They live in Asia and Africa, but totally toothless because they're mostly eating ants and termites and things like that. Armadillos, they have teeth, but they've lost the enamel, probably because ancestrally they also were insect eaters. And a close relative of an armadillo, the anteater, this one's in the same view as the pangolin, you don't see any teeth there because same sort of thing, it's eating mostly termites and ants, doesn't need those large teeth to crush those up, and so it's lost them through evolutionary time. It was a paper that came out a few years ago and they looked at this gene called enamelin. And enamelin, you might guess, is used to create enamel. These animals don't have any enamel, so they don't need the gene anymore. So one would expect, if we think we know what we're talking about, that this gene would start to decay after a while. So they came up with a tree of evolutionary relationships. They looked for this gene, they sequenced it, and they found instances of where there'd been insertions or deletions, basically, that messed up how that gene is read and made it dysfunctional. And all those little red and purple bars there, which you don't need to watch the detail, uh, know the details of, those are all in animals today that lack enamel. And all the little black hash marks on there are deletions or insertions or other frame shifts. So we can actually see the genetic material decaying after natural selection has acted to get rid of enamel on the gross level. So all the way from the gross level down to the genetic level, we can look at these leftovers. How about biogeography? If we look at just patterns of species, where they occur, not so much what they exactly look like. Mouse lemurs, definitely contender for one of the cutest animals in the world. They are the smallest primate, tiny little guys with huge eyes. They're active at night. Some live in Madagascar. There are other, well, they're exclusive Madagascar, of course. We used to think there was just one. Then someone came up with uh, a study that said, actually, there are two, one on the east side, one on the west side. And they're adapted for different environments. And then some scientists went there, and they said, well, actually, you know, look close. There are a bunch of these mouse lemurs. And they came up with eight different species based on morphology, their fur, their teeth, all sorts of other things. Came up with different scenarios for how they're related. Well, more recently, we've come up with some genetic studies that showed that, yes, there are lots of species, but they're divided north-south. 
these cryptic species, cryptic meaning species that we don't easily see, that we have to look closely at morphology or closely at, at genes, these are species that are new. These are ones that have only formed recently, and that's why they're cryptic. It makes sense if we think of evolutionary time as a continuum and these species being ones that haven't had time to diverge very much in their genes or in their morphology. Further evidence for evolution just by looking at the patterns. Archipelagos, island arcs, are another great place to look at this. Hawaii, if any of you have been to Hawaii and know anything about the geology, it sits over a hot spot, and the plate on top of it moves. So this hot spot forms volcanoes, and it starts forming an island, lots of volcanic activity, and then the plate moves, and it cools down a little bit, and then it fires up again, and it forms a new island, and then it cools down, and the plate moves. And this is what forms the Hawaiian Islands. Here's the oldest one, about 5 million years, 2.5, 1 million, half a million, and then there's a seamount where another one's probably starting to form down there. We would expect that we'd find older species here, and they get progressively younger as we go towards the big island. And that's exactly what we see. People looked at crickets, lots of different cricket species on Hawaii. And if we put a tree of evolutionary relationships up there, we see that indeed the oldest ones branched off first, and the younger ones branched off last. And then we've got a couple instances where the most recent ones have hopped back to Maui. They decided they liked it better over there. It's one way to make sense of why all these are clustered together, because they evolve through time. And we can see this on large levels, too. We don't find every animal everywhere, which is a little strange, because there are certain places in Australia where you pop down you wouldn't think you're anywhere else other than the United States. Right? They might have the same climatic conditions, semi-deserts. But of course, in Australia, you've got kangaroos. In North America, you've got things like mountain lions. If an animal is perfectly adapted to a certain environment, why don't they occur everywhere where that environment occurs? Historical contingency. Incidentally, Wallace's line is named after Alfred Russell Wallace because he was one of the people that really defined the fact that there's a large difference that you might not expect in the islands here of, in the area between Australia and Southeast Asia, and now it bears his name. Just passing across that line, you see dramatic differences in the mammals and the birds and other organisms that are found there. So I've just run through a few patterns just with modern mammals that we can look at and we can make sense of in an evolutionary context. And I've hinted at the fossil record, but none of these patterns that I talk about require a fossil record. These are all just observations of modern mammals and trying to make sense of distributions using this evolutionary context. So now let's talk about actually observing evolution, both in the long sense using the fossil record and in the short sense in terms of generations. We'll start with the recent. That's recent with a capital R, which means in the past 10,000 years or so. Artificial selection. I'm, of course, a paleontologist. If I were a cosmologist, I think recent applies to, I don't know, a few billion, probably something like that. I do appreciate the fact that you're all very familiar with deep time now, because evolutionary biologists really wouldn't be anywhere without this idea of deep time, which comes primarily from the study of geology and astronomy. Cats and dogs. Everybody loves cats and dogs. Cats are exceedingly cute. You can artificially select for all sorts of different coat colors, coat lengths, faces. But the difference between a pug and a husky is greater than you're going to see than all the cats out there. And why is this? It's not because people have been selecting dogs for a longer period than cats. Dogs have been domesticated for uh, maybe 15,000 years or something like that, and cats are close. They're probably 9,500 or 10,000. This has to do with the amount of variation that was in these groups that can be selected for. Cats are a very specific sort of animal. They're hypercarnivores, which means they're almost exclusively meat eaters. They've got a great design for it. And even if you think about the whole diversity of felids today, from tigers all the way down to your house cat, they don't really look that different. But if you think about dogs, even the wild ones, there's a lot more variation. And that's why we're able to select for all these different sorts of dog breeds that are out there. And it probably partly has to do with the fact that dogs just generally tend to be a little bit more flexible, cosmopolitan sort of mammal. 
they've got good slicing teeth, but they've also got good grinding teeth in the back. So depending on the particular dog, you may be eat almost exclusively meat, or you may have a combination of things. A lot of foxes you'll find hanging out by mulberry bushes because they like to eat fruit. And this is reflected even in artificial selection. But this is evolution in action. Most of these aren't necessarily what we call species because we've done this in an artificial context. But certainly breeding some of these animals together would be difficult, if not even unethical. Semi-natural selection. I call it semi-natural because it kind of depends on how much of part of nature do you think humans are. We definitely are part of nature, but we're kind of doing things on a different scale that we haven't seen before. And because of that, we're causing evolution at rates that probably wouldn't have happened before. And a great example of this is antibiotic resistance. And just in case you aren't familiar with what antibiotic resistance is, this gives you a little bit of a rundown. It was on a shortcut through the hospital kitchen that Albert was first approached by a member of the antibiotic resistance. <laughs> so antibiotic resistance is the phenomenon by where we find that bugs, specifically bacteria, that were once affected by antibiotics are all of a sudden not being affected by them. First, it starts with bugs that aren't affected by penicillin. And then we get ones that aren't affected by other antibiotics. And this is becoming a real issue. We, in, especially in the 70s and 80s, we really took it for granted that any time you had a bacterial infection, just throw some antibiotics at the problem and you're good to go. But now, organisms like Staph aureus, Staphylococcus, which is a common bacterium that you get with surgeries, we find that the populations are being selected such that the ones that are best adapted to survive are those that can take a hit of penicillin or can take a hit of another antibiotic. Now, fortunately, we've got lots of soil organisms out there that are producing all sorts of different antibiotics. And I'm sure we've only discovered a small proportion of these. But still, eventually we're going to run out, and it makes it tougher and tougher to treat human problems. It's only by, with a thorough understanding of evolutionary theory can we figure out how these things happen and the best way to combat them. And this gets down to those details of selection pressure and fitness. And also, it's kind of alluded to here, uh, if you can see this shady looking bacterium here has a strand of double helix DNA that he's passing off to another bacterium. Bacteria can do things and viruses that we can't do as humans, and so it gets really complicated. It isn't this straight hierarchy. You can get lateral transfer of genetic material, which makes it a real challenge. But this is something that we're bringing on ourselves. If any of you are NPR junkies like I am, you heard a story the other day on bed bugs. Bed bugs, nasty animals. There's a little life cycle on the left and just an example of bed bug bites on the right. You don't need to know a lot of the details. The important point is the same thing that we see happening in bacteria, we're starting to see happen in insects. Bed bugs are one example. Because of all the selection pressure, we're pumping lots of insecticides on them, trying to kill them. If the variation is there for certain bed bugs that are resistant, that's going to be selected for, and that's going to change the proportion of the next population. We see this in bed bugs. We also see this out in the wild or in the garden, which may be as close as a lot of us get to the wild. But this is the reason that organizations like your local extension agent, or people like your extension agent, part of the, the Ohio State University, hawk integrated pest management. And basically, the theme of integrated pest management is try to think of other ways to take care of insect problems rather than just throwing more insecticides on them. Try to work with the timing so that they're maximally effective. Try to work with other organisms that might take out the problem rather than resorting to chemicals. It's using this evolutionary knowledge to our advantage so that we don't keep selecting for superbugs, which in this case literally are superbugs. I do like Ray Troll. He's a great illustrator. <laughs> Semi-natural selection can also act on humans. Humans that do things that aren't so smart, one could argue they're being selected against. This is a really interesting question as to how much humans are being affected by evolution. Some people will say that humans aren't evolving anymore. And of course, that's not the case. Because remember, evolution is a pattern. Biological evolution has just changed through time, change in the proportions of genetic material and variation. And it's not just natural selection that accounts for evolution. So even if we argue 
that natural selection doesn't have a big role in human evolution now, which is definitely an argument, but let's just say that's the case, there are all these other processes that can contribute. And the reason it gets mucky with humans is because we've re really decoupled this whole reproduction idea. right? For a lot of people, success isn't necessarily measured by how many times you copulate and how many kids you have, which is how it is in the rest of the world. And so whether and how much this applies to humans is a really intriguing area going forward. How about fossil populations? Hopefully you had a sense that you wouldn't get out of here before I talked at least a little bit about the fossil record. I mostly do mammals, so we're mostly going to stick to mammals here. <clears throat> and I put microevolution question mark because this gets at the species issue and really what is a species and how do we recognize a species. But let's go to the example. This is an animal called Ectosion. And there's a skull up top. There are some jaws down below. This is a small animal. It's skulls on a few inches long. It is, let's just say, a primitive mammal that lived about 50 to 60 million years ago in the western US. It may be, it's not particularly closely related to, any, that's anything, uh, to anything that's alive today. But fortunately, it doesn't matter too much. What matters is that it, it's got a great fossil record. And here's a diagram that I'll walk through you, uh, walk with through you. <laughs> I don't want to do that. I'm going to walk through it with you, how about? On the bottom, we have tooth size. Mammal paleontologists love teeth because they're very hard. They have cupped with enamel, hardest substance in the human body. They're able to survive unchanged, literally, for tens of millions of years. And it allows all sorts of interesting studies. But they can also tell you a lot about the mammals themselves, about how big they are, about their feeding characteristics. So, so teeth are great. You can find a lot of them. Tooth sizes on the bottom, bigger teeth to the right, smaller teeth to the left. On the left-hand side here, we have time. And this is how geologists do time. Old is at the bottom, young is at the top. And that's because that's the way that rocks are. Rocks are laid down, and then new rocks are laid down on top of them, which have to be younger because they're on top. And new rocks are laid down on top of them, which have to be younger because they're on top. It's like building a sandwich. The top of the sandwich bread has to go on last, as long as you're not doing any flipping. And usually the flipping doesn't happen. It can happen in mountain ranges and stuff, but for the most part, not. So we're looking at mammals here that are ranging from about 56 million years to 53.6 million years. And this is a really fine scale for us. These are, each of these lines is a tenth of a million years, so 100,000 years, which is really great for the fossil record. And we can plot out each of these points is an individual specimen of Ectosion. And we can point out for one stratum the range in tooth sizes. And we can follow that up here. And we see, for the most part, you know, we get some zigzagging back and forth. But that doesn't seem to be anything di uh, directional. You could argue this is random genetic drift. Maybe there's something more here. But then all of a sudden, boom, we get this big shift to the left. They get small. And then it goes back here to the right, and they get normal sized again. All of these we call one species, Osbornianus, and then these over here we call a different species, Parvus. Are these different species or not? We'll talk more about this in a couple weeks. The important point is that we can see evolution happening through time. Either this population has evolved to a smaller body size and then gone back to its regular state, in which case when might call this microevolution. Or we could say this is macroevolution. We had one species here. It evolved into another species here. And then this is another one right here. And we can debate which might or might not be, or what, which might be more correct. But the fact of the matter is, this is evolution in action. We can actually see it in the fossil record. What's particularly interesting is that 55 million years ago, we had a huge spike in temperatures. Huge, very quick probably caused by a huge release of methane. You could do a, an entire hour very interesting story about how all this works. But it's this big temperature shift, and this is when this evolutionary event took place. It's a linkage between the population and its habitat. How about macroevolution? Usually, this is where people go first when they talk about evolution. They want to think about macroevolution, change in lineages through time. The poster child of this may be the whale, 
Here's a little sketch just summarizing the many, many whale fossils and whale relative fossils that we have. About 55 million years ago, right about the time when Ectosian was around, we've got a fully quadrupedal, four-legged, terrestrial, living on land animal that was probably predaceous, probably meat eater. And through time, through selection, we think it eventually became a whale. And we've got lots of transitional species. We have animals like Pachycetus, which is that sketch on top with perfectly well-formed legs, got a very large head, the teeth are very whale-like. We've got Cuchacetus, which isn't on there, but you can see how it's got that same sort of head, but it's elongate. The feet have been reduced. They're probably more for swimming in the water. And we can fill all this in. There are tons and tons and tons of examples of nice evolutionary series like this with species changing through time and illustrating origins of major evolutionary groups. Whales are different. You're not going to mistake a whale for anything else. But it doesn't happen by a different process. It's the same process happening through long periods of time. Gradual change through natural selection and those other processes that I talked about before. Manatees are a great example that you're never going to hear about. So I'm going to throw them in here. Because it's the same thing. It's equally surprising. You've got these Terrestrial mammals that become aquatic mammals. Manatees and sea cows, dugongs. Daryl Domning, who is the resident expert in manatees, because there really aren't that many manatees and there aren't even that many fossils, he found this animal called Pizosiren in Jamaica. If you're thinking about becoming a paleontologist, I highly recommend Caribbean paleontology. Good place to go do field work. This is a 50 million year old manatee. It's got a skull just like a manatee but it's got perfectly formed legs. And it's virtually complete. If you can see these gray things, it's missing the feet. So it's missing the feet, it's got a little bit missing there, and they're missing the tip of the tail, but everything else is complete. So we're not having to fill in the skeleton much at all. Perfect intermediate form between a regular run-of-the-mill terrestrial ungulate, something that's closely related to an elephant, which we think manatees are, and then the fully aquatic animals that we see today. And the, Again, it's something that we could go on with for years and years and years and years and years. Extinction, which I guess you could think of maybe as negative evidence, certainly negative for the things that are going extinct. But extinction, which we certainly, everyone accepts these days, was really a new concept back in the way of Darwin, back in the way, back in the time of Darwin. They really didn't think that species went extinct that species were formed in a certain way. You might get some variation, but that variation was essentially imperfections. And they would persist, and they wouldn't go extinct. So Charles Darwin took this trip around South America, where they went around the eastern side, down near Argentina, and they went around and ended up by the Galapagos, by Ecuador, and eventually came back. And we hear a lot about the finches and the tortoises and the mockingbirds on Galapagos, which gets back to that example of archipelagos. But one of the really pivotal points for Darwin was down near Buenos Aires, which I'd add is also not a bad place to go do field work. There are fossils there of Pleistocene age. And the Pleistocene is the time period just before the recent with a capital R, which means it's about 10,000 years all the way back to, well, the definition has changed, anywhere from about 1.4 million to closer to 2.8 million, but it's pretty recent. Tens of thousands of years overlapped with the humans that got to South America just a little bit before then. Darwin found fossils of these mega mammals, which isn't surprising because they're mega, which means big. So they're big, they're out there, they're easy to find. And what he found were these things, which are notoungulates and lit up terns, which you may have never heard about, unless you happen to do some web stalking before this lecture. Notoungulates and lit-up terns are endemic South American ungulates, which means they're hoofed mammals, and they're found nowhere else. Unfortunately, they're totally extinct, but they were in South America for most of the time between the when dinosaurs went extinct and where we are today. The last ones only went extinct in the Pleistocene, and these are reconstructions of a couple of them. Toxodon, which you can see here is a large cow to rhino-sized animal, Probably wasn't semi-aquatic, but certainly could have hung around water holes. And then Macrocenia, which is a large, really a giant camel-like animal, which if you've ever seen the 
cartoon Ice Age. I think that's the only time that it's been on the big screen. So he found both of these, and they obviously weren't around today, and the great anatomist Charles Owen didn't know where to stick them. He had this nice organizational scheme for mammals, and he said, well, they're somewhere between rodents and pachyderms. It's essentially between rats and elephants, which is about as big a net as you can cast. Darwin also found these things, giant ground sloths. And when I say giant, I'm talking the size of an elephant, eight tons. Giant glyptodonts, almost the size of the Volkswagen. If you want to see one of these, go to the Cleveland Museum of Natural History. There's a cast of one in the Kirtland Hall with all those big dinosaurs. Go look at the really cool glyptodont that's there by the saber-toothed cat. Darwin saw that these looked a lot like armadillos and thought, these must be ancient relatives of armadillos that aren't around today. The idea, the fact that there was extinction really turned on a light bulb for him that said, species are not immutable. And there are different ones that have been here before that aren't here now. And that's some evidence for evolution. So again, the take-home patterns, messages. Biological patterns are evolutionary patterns. Organisms are related in nested hierarchy. And they're shaped by natural selection. Remember, these patterns result from several processes, one of which is natural selection. And the two big things that affect animals' morphology are ancestry and adaptation. And we'll just leave you with this quotation by the great geneticist, Dubjansky, so you can make some sense of that. And I thank you for your attention, and we'll be happy to take any questions.